Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Geek Talk MD. Yeah. This is actually, uh, we're still at episode 17, which was yeah. the last episode, but we're at part two. <laughs> Numero do. Yeah. Uh, if you may recall, when we last left our heroes, uh, mm -hmm. we were discussing martial arts. Uh, so we were concentrating mostly on like movies and, and such like. Yeah. But then uh, one of our guests, Pete, uh, got into a really good discussion about the history of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts and the Ultimate That's Fighting right. Championship. And it was just so good, you know, and so fascinating uh, yeah. that... Uh, well, we didn't know what to cut it. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. You know, and, and despite popular demand, it's not, we didn't mess up uh, as usual. Uh, <laughs> this wasn't uh, one of those cases for a change and... and that's our story and sticking to it. Uh, it's, um, you know, as Moses said, we, we, we knew that we were running a little short. So we did warn people in the recording that we may have to cut it. But um, or uh, at the time, we were really thinking we just may have to trim it short. But uh, after listening to it uh, quite a few times, uh, I was trying to find a place, to, you know, places that we can save some time. But it was really rock solid. I mean, he really had his thoughts put together. It was interesting. It was exactly what we asked for. Oh yeah, um, and and I really I don't know if he could have even have made it any shorter, but um, and we had some great conversation in there. I didn't want to lose out on, so I said, you know what, forget it. You know, we're just gonna keep it, <laughs> keep it. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> so, so Pete, we gave yourself your own, pretty much your own episode, but it, it was well worth it because uh, the information that he that he provided was just awesome. Yes, it was. So, so yeah. we're just going to. That's right. Pretty much go back to where we left off, yeah. um, and you'll you'll pretty much catch on fairly quickly. Yeah. So just well, sit back, we, relax. We, we, have the, we have the luxury of having an intellectual crowd, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, we don't have to explain ourselves too much. <laughs> Other than we didn't make the mistake this time. <laughs> yeah. So just sit back, relax, open your ears real wide, and yeah. enjoy the show. Hoo Today's episode of Geek Talk MD is not brought to you by High Karate Aftershave. High Karate, the only aftershave that comes with its own pamphlet of self-defense techniques. High Karate, be careful how you use it. hi -ya! Oh, yeah! <laughs> We talked about blood sport and, and the different art and so forth, and then you had the philosophy of martial arts from from before. And oh yes, talking, yes. We, we touched a little bit on it earlier, but we're talking now about the I find the more refined uh, or, or the the refinement of martial arts into some of the different styles that we see today in different military groups, um, and then of course in the MMA. Um, oh yes, uh, been, starting off with UFC. Oh yeah. Oh man. I mean, I remember seeing the first couple of uh, those tournaments, and mm -hmm. the whole idea, I mean, it was it was a perfect extension of the whole concept of the Bloodsport movie, all mm -hmm. these different martial arts, you know, what if a sumo wrestler fought a kung fu master, or, yeah. or a ninja fought a boxer, or God knows what. And, and you can mm -hmm. still see you can still see YouTube videos of those types of matches still happening oh, yeah. today, right? All the time, you know, uh, uh, Taekwondo versus karate, or you know, what, what not, what not. But I mean, you know, in in these particular uh, events, um, you know, really do get a, an opportunity to see you know some real experts in the field, yeah, and and they're really going at it. You know? But it, it became pretty obvious very early on that there was one style that. Or, I don't know if it was so much the style or that one person's um, uh, utilization or mastery of its of that style mm. just seemed to dominate from the get go. Uh, Hoist Gracie using Brazilian mm -hmm. jiu jitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, would well, you know the story of how uh, you know the UFC was created and no. Gracie jiu jitsu? I, no. no, not really. No. Tell us how much. Tell how us. much. How much time you got, buddy? We got we got some we got some. We uh, you take take as long as you want. We just cut out a bit of part. 
Or okay, we may no, just listen. edit this out completely if we decide that it's useless. <laughs> no, no, no. We no, might no, do that. No, no, but actually I want to know. So, And I actually want to know more about this than what you were blabbering on about Moses. So <laughs> carry on. <laughs> okay, so just... Blabber, real... blabber, 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 <laughs> blabber, blabber. So just in a real no, no, no. surface, uh, you know, like we're just going to really kind of touch on it, really terse mm-hmm. synopsis of this whole thing, right? So yeah. you got to go back to like, to, to see the real, <laughs> the, the rise of jujitsu where it first arose is like back in the 1300s. Uh, okay. Well, so, I yeah. I going to say, and then there was light. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was all Jewish. You could. <laughs> most, of the mar- most of the martial arts are Jewish. Anyway, you got, you got judo, jujitsu. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> move along from his visions of grandeur. <laughs> so, so, okay, so when you you think about martial arts, martial arts was developed as a form of combat. I mean, this wasn't fun and games and all this nonsense. So, you think about when you're gonna fight people, like Dave was referring to with the, the peasants and all that. So, when you're in a combat situation with opponents who are not only armored, but also carrying arms, mm-hmm. swords and spears and all this type of stuff, imagine if you were to try to employ a striking type of discipline, mm-hmm. right? So, you, you're going to punch a fully armored guy, steel armor, right? Mm-hmm. You're essentially going to break your hand, and then he's going to cut you in half, right? <laughs> so, not necessarily because in of that the order. way that armor was designed, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> this is assuming you can get past the sword in the first place. I mean, the only reason you would attempt it is if you were disarmed yourself in the battle and your backup weapon broke and you're really mm. in dire straits that so you've got to go hand-to-hand in the melee, right? Mm-hmm. So, so um, the way that armor was designed was to give the wearer the uh, range of motion to be able to use his weapon effectively, right? Mm-hmm. So so um, this this... This allowance mm-hmm. of range of motion actually can create a negative uh, uh, aspect to it too, <laughs> because um, <laughs> so so now you have joint manipulation comes into yeah. play. It would be much more effective striking somebody with armor on, and so yeah, if you true. break someone's arm, he'd be unable to use his weapon effectively, right? Mm-hmm. And he basically so becomes this... trapped in his own armor, right? And also. Uh, the idea of being able to trip or throw this guy because mm-hmm. he's going to be more off balance because of the armor. And then once he's on his back, how do you get back up? I've fallen and I can't get up. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this well, is and where some grappling. Could... Yeah, exactly. So this is how grappling became more effective as a combative art than striking. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to fast forward away for this is like between the 1300s this began because they wanted to combat samurai and stuff. Right. Right. Yes. So we're going to fast forward all the way to the late 1800s now. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to talk about a man named Kano Jigoro. He was a, a young man from a wealthy family. He was very well educated, but he was tiny. We're talking mm-hmm. 5 to 90 pounds. He's so small. it's he's small. small. Interesting because SML. he was, he was kind of small. He, he was kind of a geek when you think about it. You yeah, know, he's a really small <laughs> guy. Yeah, he's the hero in the story. Yay! So they only uh, because come up of this, to your knees and they're short. <laughs> I like Chinese. I like Chinese. They only come up to your knees. Yet they're always friendly and they're ready to please. Listen, this is Japan, okay? <laughs> I know. Don't, don't start getting racist. Off. This is Japan. It is so works. I like Japanese. <laughs> I like Japanese. <laughs> they cut, cut you your off at your knees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you were saying. Sorry. Yeah, so because he was such a, you know, sure guy. small guy. Smaller. Yeah, he was a, a friend of the fla- uh, uh, a friend of the family. It was a shogun's guard. Decided to show him some jujitsu techniques to help him bulk up and shogun assassin. He, said he wasn't scared of the shogun, but the shogun was scared of him. Husband, maybe that was the problem. Yeah, that was a good. <laughs> and he liked it, right? Mm-hmm. And so his parents sent him to Tokyo to uh, study in university. But he liked this jujitsu so much, he started to seek out trainers. But at this time, this was, you know, the late 1800s, this was modern Japan. So you had guns on the scene, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And jujitsu was seen as this archaic, barbaric practice. It was like uh, the thuggery 
mm-hmm. these guys who were the, the art of breaking bones and choking people and killing people. This is, mm-hmm. you know, a completely negative stigma yeah. surrounding. It was like a shunned form of martial arts. It was almost, yeah. you know, an embarrassment, right? Yeah. And so uh, Jagoro had a tough time finding uh, teachers, but he found practitioners amongst the bone setters. So this is kind of oh, like a, uh, a chiropractor. So yeah. the guys who were in this like this dark practice could only find a means to support themselves, a craft. Well, if, if, I may, if I people. may interrupt you for yeah. a second, I should stress what what you are referring to is not the same thing as what Westerners refer to as chiropractors. Bone setting, no, no, do- no, no, no. Bone setting doctors in Japan are of are a completely different uh, are, are a completely yeah. different set of science and far more respected. Than, mm-hmm. absolutely, you know, absolutely. than chiropractors over here. It mm-hmm. is not not at all the same yeah. thing, or just as, a, as an analogy, kind of mm-hmm. um, similar in the sense that it's not exactly the um, accepted medical science over there. Like, you know, you go to a, to a hospital, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you, you had these guys. And so it's interesting that the same guys who knew how to break your arm knew how to fix it. Do you know what you're doing? I have detailed files on human anatomy. Bet. Makes you a more efficient killer, right? Correct. And because they yeah. were, they were, the practice, the, the art was shunned, they had to find a, uh, a, a way to make money. So this was a craft they went into bone setting, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, long story short, he starts training in jiu-jitsu. He rises up the ranks. He masters jiu-jitsu. And then as you know, his, his former masters start to die off, he inherits these like preserved ancient scrolls it's centuries mm-hmm. old I and mean, they have all the cool martial arts secrets and techniques mm-hmm. in there so uh, the secrets of the scrolls there's always that's what scrolls. you want yeah exactly right. <laughs> he's the dragon warrior so at, at this point this older Skidoosh. wiser uh jigoro he starts to refine jujitsu into this form that only uses the most effective and non-lethal techniques and he calls it judo okay, okay. Uh... so this guy we're talking about is the founder of judo Right. Okay. So now you got wow. this repackaged, rebranded uh, martial art. Mm-hmm. So he wanted to preserve this jujitsu technique and discard some of the negative stigma that was attached to it because he mm-hmm. loved it so much. He wanted to clean it up. Right. Mm-hmm. So he 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 did kind of nerf the style mm-hmm. by introducing a bunch of. I'm rules sorry. Did you just and... say nerf the style? Yeah. Yeah. He nerfed. There was a balance the... patch. Nobody let you know. It took a little <laughs> bit of getting used to. It was. It was a really decisive time, you know. Well, oh, really, nerf. Okay. Really, you could you could look at it in the continue. sense of continue. You could look at it uh, in the sense that he introduced a number of um, rules and he put up a bunch of barriers on some of the more lethal stuff. But he essentially mm-hmm. changed it into more of a sport. We did judo, mm-hmm. right? Okay. So it's safer to practice. It's safer to um, uh, compete. It's you know. Uh, less mm-hmm. less brutal to observe as a fan, let's say. Yeah, I mean, right? to this day, it's still the only martial art that is actually uh, a recognized sport in the Olympics. That's right. That's this, right. Re- th- this really is a balance patch. We're going from melee to brawl. <laughs> Interesting you say that because um, uh, uh, Jiguro went on to, obviously, he's the one who forwarded judo into the Olympics, and he became the first Asian member of the International Olympic Committee. Interesting, but wow. uh, that's okay. Yeah. So, how do we get to uh, Hoist Gracie? Well, we're, we're we're getting there. Okay. So, um, that's that's the line we don't have to go down with uh, Jigoro and Judo. Another uh, fun fact is that Judo was exported to Russia, and that's how you get the Sambo that you uh, mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I heard that. And so, I only had to mention Jigoro because he's such a prominent figure in martial arts. You have to mention him, and a really well, brilliant no. guy too, and a geek. Right, he I, went on like to I... be like the director of the Ministry of Education in Japan. Oh, cool. You know. So uh, again, there's there's all these different branches, and I really want to focus on this one specific trajectory of uh, yeah. jujitsu that we're talking about. So, so we uh, we go over to Mitsuyo Maeda once again, wide-eyed mm-hmm. youngster. He's going to Tokyo yeah. for university, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The difference is he's interested in this judo thing that everyone's talking about now, yeah. right? So, of course, he ends up at Jigoro School. Yeah. Again, long story short, he masters judo. But here's where the uh, divergence happens. His philosophy mm-hmm. isn't uh, doesn't coincide with Jigoro's, right? Mm-hmm. Who is a really peaceful guy who wants to clean up the sport. He feels 
the best way to prove the effectiveness of judo or mm -hmm. jujitsu is through combat. Okay. Right? So which means, again, discarding the rules and reintroducing those dangerous uh, combative techniques that mm -hmm. Jigoro had exercised out of the system, right. which, of course, was frowned upon by Jigoro and the boys over in mm -hmm. the judo. So um, he wasn't exactly excommunicated, but they didn't like it. And so he kind of went his own way. He was shunned. Mm -hmm. And now, right. And so now we uh, fast forward a uh, a few hundred uh, no holds barred, bare fisted uh, mm -hmm. challenge matches and tournaments that Maeda traveling around the world, like we mentioned earlier, very much like the Street Fighter video game. This guy <laughs> yeah. is like the real life Ryu. He just went out and fought all over the world, and yeah. for the only reason to increase his own abilities. You know, right. that's exactly like Ryu. Exactly right. If you want to defeat, oh wait, no. Continue, please. You'll have to defeat my sure you can to stand a chance. Right. <laughs> okay, so back to traveling around the world. Ah, uh, yeah. So he becomes known as a... He gets the nickname of Mr. Impossible. Because, again, he's also one of these smaller guys. Right? Yeah, because and let's face eating... it, with that, with that accent, you couldn't say Mr. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> So he's a small guy. He's defeating these much larger opponents almost effortlessly. Like if you see mm -hmm. judo, it's all about using your opponent's weight and yeah. momentum against him momentum. and all that redirecting, right? Yeah, now, As opposed I almost to, thought that was Aikido. That Aikido too. Aikido falls into that category too of these right. uh, the gentler arts, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. so, uh, um, again, he you know he's going around the world. He lands in Brazil. Is where mm -hmm. the interesting uh, sort, and he's got here his partner go. there. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. We're getting into. We're in the home stretch. So <laughs> we're we're one third of the way there. All right. I can see <laughs> the light. <laughs> Careful, it so, might be a train. Um... <laughs> Damn you, Ben Affleck. <laughs> what? Oh, <it's> background, so. <laughs> and so this uh, going throughout the world, he lands in Brazil with his partner, who I'm just going to gloss over. Is kind of like when we were talking about Alan Turing's uh, partner before. Uh, yeah. yeah, we don't care about his partner. So okay. Uh, this is this guy Satake? So when they settled in Brazil, they opened up a school, and Satake was basically running the school the day to day while Maeda was going out and still going around the world and fighting people, right? Mm -hmm. So, some years later, uh, 1925, Maeda um, returned to Brazil, and he was assisting this Japanese company settling landed Japanese immigrants into Brazil. They were doing this this project, and they were like sponsored by the government. It was an economic thing, but so. It was in these dealings that he met Gastow Gracie, who was a politician at the time that was helping him to um, naturalize some of these Japanese immigrants. So right. Jap uh, Maeda offers to train Gustav's son, Carlos Gracie, who was mm -hmm. 14 at the time, in jiu-jitsu as, as appreciation for assisting in cutting through some of the red tape, right? Right, right. So that, that's, that's the connection from Japan to Brazil. So now... Carlos Gracie teaches his younger brother Elio and the mm -hmm. rest of the family. It trickles down from there. The Gracies. And, yeah, yeah, the Gracie family. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, though I've never seen him compete. I understand that uh, Hoyce's older brother Hickson is actually far more uh, dangerous than Hoyce ever was. Hickson was the best of all the Gracies. Nobody denies it by and, far. And correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, that was him in the Incredible Hulk movie training banner at one's in one scene isn't it yep yep uh, doing that whole thing with his abdominal muscles that was pretty impressive yeah well he's a yoga master there's, there's so many things i mean listen if we're going to talk about hickson we're not going to make it we're not going to make it in time but <laughs> i would it, recommend but, to yeah. watch uh, the documentary choke it's all about okay. hickson it's incredible it's really worth right. watching for anyone mm -hmm. listening. Okay. um um so uh so now Carlos, you know, passes the buck down through, throughout the family. But then it isn't long before Carlos is making challenges in Brazil. Now, mm -hmm. he wants to fight in these challenge matches because um, basically what he learned was jiu-jitsu, the way that mm -hmm. Maeda had been practicing it in these fights, not judo with the rules. Mm -hmm. So they got the raw, the raw form of it. Right? Mm -hmm. So they created something called the Gracie Challenge. Mm -hmm. And they were having guys come in to their dojo and fight them. Sometimes it was for money. There's all, all types of stories. Mm -hmm. But he started putting out these Gracie Challenge videos that was produced with a camcorder in their garage, right? Uh. <laughs> so they would have a karate hmm. guy come in, right? Mm -hmm. And they would say, okay, it's, here's, a, here's the rules. There's no rules except for biting and eye gouging. And mm -hmm. this is the way it ends. You either submit 
or you're unconscious. Those right. were the only route. No rounds, no... Carlos Gracie now, he ended up having 21 children and over 100 grandchildren. 21? Yes. What? Yes. Okay, so he wasn't spending that much time challenging people to fights. He, he's, <laughs> yeah. he obviously had plenty of... plenty. Of, he was I, busy being a rabbit. Um, check a wow wow. Yes. <laughs> and, and I, well, I, guess that, my... I guess that kind of destroys the boxing, uh, the wisdom of all these boxing coaches saying, Women weaken legs. Yeah. That, uh, sex weakens your yeah. legs. Yeah, so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you, you can imagine, you know, 21 children, this has spanned over various uh, three wives and then some okay. others who weren't wives, uh, but uh, okay. there's a whole bunch. So 21 children and a hundred, over a hundred grandchildren. To the window, to the wall, to the sweat drip from my ball. <laughs> so I, I'm going to proceed to explain <laughs> every single one of their stories. Okay, child number one. No, no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, the synopsis of it is many of the kids wanted to follow in the footstep of Maeda. Mm -hmm. So when they were training jujitsu, they started going around the world and competing right. with other fighters. They yeah. wanted to, you want to be a warrior, right? Yeah. And so the benefit of this was, as they're experiencing all these different techniques in different countries of the world, they they start to find uh, unique problems being posed by certain fighters, and mm -hmm. so they brought that back to Brazil. Well, what kind of problems? Do you mean, you mean like well, uh, I mean, environment? No, 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 no. I mean like, techniques. Like, the, like there, there would be one technique. Oh, okay, wait a second. Our standard techniques in jujitsu oh, don't get us thing. past okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So. They will bring all this information and experience back to Brazil, mm -hmm. and then they would either incorporate it into their style or devise some kind of a method to, to counteract it. To deal technique. with it, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So this is, is kind of how they evolved this martial art that it came from Japan and Jiu-Jitsu, mm -hmm. and they kind of put their own little spin on it. This is Gracie mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, I have to put a, a little thing in here. Uh, the Gracies were not the only ones who trained at Maeda school. There are other mm -hmm. lineages in Brazil that lead to other branches. So this is mm -hmm. not to be biased. It's not only the Gracies, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but the Gracies are the ones we're... that really uh, marketed themselves, there... shall we say. Yes. There's a reason why we're going down this road, because it leads to the UFC, which the other lineages right. don't, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so they were developing the style. Fast forward now to 1978. Hor okay. Horian Gracie, who's the mm -hmm. eldest son of Elio, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he moved to California and opened up the first Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in the U.S. So, uh, fun fact here, 1980, Horian met with film director Richard Donner. Moses? Ooh, Moses? Superman. <laughs> Superman. And what else? Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was asked to choreograph... Fight the fight scene on the weapon. front lawn! What do you say, Jack? Would you like a shot at the title? Don't mind if I do. Yes. This uh, is where Mel Gibson was fighting Gary Busey, right? And so when he choked him out with his knees, all right. That was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu triangle choke that he submitted Gary Busey. Well, spoiler alert, Mel Gibson submits oh, Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> please. If you haven't seen it by now, that ship has sailed. <laughs> So that was that was awesome. okay. One, that explains one of the greatest a lot. fight scenes of all time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The iconic then, fight scene. Then, right? then what do you say about? I mean, if if you'd gotten somebody, I mean, forgive me for the for the interruption, but I mean, if you go to if you fast forward to Lethal Weapon Four, it's painfully obvious that uh, uh, Riggs' character is getting completely outclassed by the villain played by Jet Li. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm. I'm assuming that that wouldn't necessarily be the case, would it? Well, it depends on uh, how much. Well, think about it this way: Mel Gibson, his character, uh, you know. Oh yeah, they, they, uh, Martin they, Riggs. I'm yeah, saying. they yeah. do stress in the movie that by that point that Riggs is is old. Yeah, and he just well, he can't old. he can't seem to cut it anymore. Like he gets into right. a boxing match with another cop yeah. who's half his age, and the other cop kicks his ass. And the other thing is about jujitsu, like, you don't really need to know a whole lot to be effective against someone who's unskilled, right? Mm -hmm. True. So he may have just had a surface understanding of jujitsu, and Jet Li's character is just a beast, right? Yeah. Oh, and ridiculously like one fast. of these uh, Maeda characters. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. Okay, so how do, we get, how do we get to UFC? 
we're we're right on the cusp of it here, right? Mm-hmm. So okay, dive in. Uh, so he's 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 right in there, and so uh, Horian at this point he's trying to build up his schools and the Gracie name. He's making connections. Mm-hmm. Then he had this idea of creating what is essentially the biggest Gracie challenge video of all time, mm-hmm. right? That's a pay per view event in the United States called mm-hmm. the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Okay. So there this relates is. directly to his homemade uh, camcorder challenge matches in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Right? And so in mm-hmm. conjunction with his friend Art Davey, who is the vice president of K1 Kickboxing, mm-hmm. the largest kickboxing promotion in the world, and um, uh, he's the, actually the guy who got K1 on pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. Uh, another uh, interesting little geeky fact for you, famed writer, director, and producer John Milius was a student of Horian. Uh, and he, he helped mm-hmm. him develop the, the Octagon. Interesting. Oh, I remember so, that movie. No, not the movie. Oh, okay. No, but uh, it's for for those who don't know, the octagon's the fenced-in uh, enclosure oh, okay. with the surface that the fighters compete on, and still yeah. to this day. Yeah. So think yeah. about John Milius uh, designed that octagon that's still used today. No, very but interesting. What, what, and, and what is there, uh, is there a John Milius of the octagon? Sorry. I mean, well, uh, outside of the, uh, outside of the unusual shape, but why? You know, like could it have been a pen? You know. It could have, yeah. Anything, any other, but I, I wasn't sure if there was something specific about that shape that had some sort of, you know. No, there's no significance or, to the okay. octagon if you're thinking like the Olympic rings type of thing. No, no. there's no significance. I, sh- I should point out for anybody listening who doesn't know, uh, John Milius is the uh, writer slash director of the original uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger film Conan the Barbarian. Right. Oh. Amongst okay. a bunch of others, I think he he wrote Apocalypse Now. Right. Uh, did he write Apocalypse mm-hmm. Now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, a whole yeah. bunch. Okay. Of, we, you know, you'll get lost in his IMDb. Anyhow, you know, and so um, <laughs> so this whole UFC fiasco yeah. was an attempt for fiasco. Horian. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was an attempt for Horian to showcase the effectiveness of Gracie Jiu Jitsu on this massive stage. Well, in the end, know? that's basically what happened. I mean, it, it that's did, what it was because was I mean, you did get to see you did get to see some incredible matchups and other matchups that you would have expected to be unbelievable that turned out to be a joke. I mean, mm. I remember there exactly. was there was one match I can't remember. I think it was a, 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 a guy who was a what they called a shoot fighter. Going up mm-hmm. against a guy who claimed to be a ninja master, and the oh, ninja God. and the ninja was taken out out cold in under fifteen seconds. Yeah, it was it was well. really sad. Uh, hmm. Yeah, or, there, there is a lot of that. Or, the poor you, guy. That guy, by the way, was an alternate, and it was it was this really <sighs> small guy. You know, it's these unassuming accountant looking type of yeah, uh, yeah. guys yeah. who start studying With a little martial. mustache too. It's kind of like an Uncle Rico thing from oh, Napoleon God. Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of those type of guys. But, but you know what? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the one fight that I remember from UFC that to this day stands out in my memory, it was – I can't remember which uh, which UFC it was, but it was the final match for the, for the title that year, and it was between Tank Abbott and Dan Severn. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you remember that fight, Pete? Yep. And again – like Tank Abbott was a monster, completely dominant. He, every person he got into the ring with, he destroyed. And you were completely expecting it to be like this amazing fight because Severn was this massive, incredibly well-trained wrestler. Yeah. And in the end, he basically took down Tank Abbott in seconds and then basically had him cowering on the mat bitch slapping him for the rest of the fight. That was it. And every time that Tank Abbott tried to even move, he'd bitch slap him again until he tapped out. Yeah, Tank Abbott was a guy who was vehemently opposed to martial arts. He oh, was, he was he was just a monster. <laughs> yeah, he hated martial arts. He didn't want to learn martial arts. He wanted to drink a beer and get into like a, a brawl in a bar, you know? He's like a right, biker right. looking type of guy. Um, Interesting. But seven, so then so, they had the UFC, oh yeah. and then how does it make the segue there? Okay, so um, uh, so you need to have obviously a a, a Gracie Jiu Jitsu fighter to represent in this UFC tournament, right? That's right, the whole right. point of this thing. So this is where uh, uh, Moses' example of um, Hickson comes in, because mm-hmm. Hickson was the biggest, baddest, meanest Gracie, but he's a a muscled guy, great physique. Yeah, he's most people that know that know right? of him say. 
that he is an absolute animal. That one of no, the baddest men on no, the, that ever No one lived. wants to get into the ring with him, ever. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, okay. uh, so they didn't choose Hickson, though, because they felt if they put in this, uh, this guy who's so imposing and well-built yeah. that they would think it's, well, it's this man. It's like you were yeah. talking about, Dave, right? Mm-hmm. It's this man's physique and conditioning. He won the fight, not necessarily the, the techniques, right? right? And so that's why they chose who was the smallest, skinniest member of the Gracie family, mm-hmm. who was Hoist. Hoist Gracie, he weighed 170 pounds. And he was going in there against guys who went up to like 300 pounds. The interesting thing was, this way, it was much more impressive, kind of like um, the the whole thing about Maeda. This is how Mm -hmm. it all ties in. This is why Maeda was, uh, you know, um, Mr. Impossible and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. You wanted to see a small guy take out a bigger guy, right? Yeah. So that's exactly what they did, and it went... Exactly according to plan, Hoist won the tournament. Gracie Jiu Jitsu blew up, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. How many the, years in a row did he win? Um, he won the first two, and then on the third one, he had to fight Kimo Leopoldo, who is a roided up, just a, a monster, right? Uh. Mm-hmm. And he uh he he beat Kimo. It's funny if you watch the fight. Kimo came to the ring carrying a cross. Like, oh. like Jesus. I mean, full mm-hmm. size, a real wooden cross, you know? Was this the one where, where Gracie ended, like, even though he won the match, he dislocated his shoulder? Yeah, yeah. and he had to pull out. Yeah. yeah. So he had to pull out. So he didn't win that one, but he did beat Kimo, right? Yeah, he should have <laughs> won the tournament, but yeah. Yeah. The, the I mean, to be, able to, is... to be able to beat that monster with yeah. a dislocated shoulder, I mean, that was impressive. It's heart, heart for days, yeah. you know? But I mean, the thing being is, you know, that's kind of the point of it. If you are thinking it from a business perspective that, you know, you don't want uh, people thinking, oh, I have to be like this in order to learn this art. You want to appeal to all shapes and sizes and thinking that, oh, I could do that too after a few uh, lessons or after, you know, maybe if I take advantage of this, um, you know, first month free. Uh, I, you know, I might learn enough to, to do my thing, but then get into the sport later on. I mean, it's all hooks to, to join the gym and stay with the art. For sure. That's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, so the first few events went great. And then uh, something something threw a monkey wrench into it. In the the fourth UFC 4, they went over the time on the pay-per-view, oh. which, you know, is insanely expensive, right? Kiss right. and death. Yeah, and so uh, uh, Davey, who was a business partner and, you know, the K1 guy and some of the money guys behind it, they decided that that couldn't ever happen again, so they wanted to put in, you know, time limits, rounds, uh, points, judges, all this stuff, and, of course, Horian was disgusted because it went away from his original view of it, but he felt that his mission to expose this uh, form of jujitsu to the whole world was accomplished, so he said, okay, fine, so he walked away at that point. Right. And now um, uh, the rest of it from there on, it becomes – it's really about business and politics. But I mean right. I could sum it up in a couple sentences real quick. Okay, well basically what happened was um, uh, Art Davey took over the show and then mm-hmm. John McCain publicly called it human cockfighting. I don't know if you remember that, right? Oh, right. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. remember that? And this actually had a huge impact on the sport and Davey ended up losing millions. You know, and really? then this is where Dana White comes in. At the time, he was he was managing Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz. He was a fighter. Ah, the manager. Iceman. Yeah. Chuck Liddell. Yeah. And uh, he and his friend uh, that he went to school with, Lorenzo Fertitta, and uh, Lorenzo is one of the Fertitta brothers who are you know they were already billionaires by that point. They own uh, Station Casinos and other other properties mm-hmm. in Vegas. So. They came in, and they pretty much went, I think it was $100 million into debt Ouch. With, uh, oh, after man. buying the UFC. Ouch. And here, here's the interesting part. They essentially did what uh, Jigoro did. They took this crazy, no-rules, bare-knuckle thing, and they, they started to clean it up. They created the mm-hmm. unified rules of mixed martial arts. They put gloves in there. Mm-hmm. They got it sanctioned by the Athletic Commission. So... They took again. It's this this mm-hmm. deadly barbaric art of jujitsu and mm-hmm. uh, cleaned it up for a for a mainstream appeal, mm-hmm. right? And uh, well, 
I mean, let's be clear here. Jagoro was an idealist, and Dana mm-hmm. and the gang were capitalists. They had different reasons sure. for doing it. Yeah. yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. but it's the same thing. To so, be perfectly um, honest, though, I, I preferred I the old. I got into it. I preferred yeah, the old UFC. Well, in some ways it was better, and in some ways it wasn't. But um, so they lost, let's say they lost a hundred million in the hole, and then mm-hmm. the Ultimate Fighter reality show came out. And mm-hmm. once that happened, it just went through the roof, and now the UFC is worth somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, four to five billion dollars, well, and still yeah. growing. Yeah, and will continue because again, you know, now you know, again, we're we're bringing, um, I want to say obtainable, but you know, more realistic uh, styles that people can learn. That can make them very effective, no matter what size or shape that they are. And you know, the more you learn, the better you get, of course. But um, you know, these are very practical things that that we're learning. It's not like some abstract form or original kung fu technique that you have to spend your entire life to learn. Um, in and it's order useless. To be truly effective, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, Whereas I'm, I'm this... not. I, 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 the opinions expressed by the guests are not necessarily the opinions of the, of Dave and Moses. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm by no means saying that no. kung fu is is useless. I'm saying there are no, some but, techniques. But, some but techniques. But yeah. At the end of the day, it comes down to you know dealing with the person right here and now, and you know it doesn't necessarily matter if you have all of the um, mental strength and awareness to you know hear crickets flying, but if you get shot. It, while you're preparing, you get shot. It's not going to help you a <laughs> yeah. lot. Well, there, there's this rather funny deal video with it right there and then, right? Yeah. Like you know, some sort of grab or some sort of choke or some sort of, you know, whatever to get out of that situation right here and now. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a rather, there's a rather funny video online of I, I think it's one of the elder Gracies uh, doing this because uh, I think it said a Brazilian jiu-jitsu master uh, demonstrating the ultimate technique against someone who uh, attacks you with a gun. Mm-hmm. And the guy, you know, the, the, the guy points a gun at this old guy and the old guy runs away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or they would just yeah. put his hands up. No, he, yeah, he, yeah. he literally just ran away. <laughs> well, but, but the thing being is, and one of the questions I was going to ask, uh, uh, you know, now that we, we've come to this journey um, to to MMA and so forth, and I didn't know a lot of the history of it, so I appreciate uh, you bringing that to the table. It was fascinating, mm-hmm. but um, you know, part again, part of the interest I had was with regards to the philosophy, and you know, as we go into common like modern day, you know, we, we see the refinement of the art and the, you know, you can't argue with the effectiveness of it, you know, be it with the military forms or. Uh, you know, with the gray seas and so forth, you can't argue with the effectiveness of the of of the um, of the form. But you know that divergence from the philosophical aspect of it. Do you think that that is a loss? Um, do you think that you know it, is it better that it's cleaner? What What are your thoughts to it? You know. Oh, like, there's absolutely pros and cons. You know, yeah. and um, I think it's a sign of the times also because if you're in you know feudal Japan. You yeah. probably don't want a gentle art, you know? Yeah, yeah. And if, you know, we're at pretty much relatively at peacetime now, you probably mm-hmm. don't want a brutal art either. Well, mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the reason why most of the martial arts uh, fell into disrepute in Japan was that because most of them were uh, uh, forced down everybody's throats as part of the propaganda during World War II. And after the, the, the uh, surrender, Pretty much every aspect of Japanese militancy was crushed, wiped out, and and almost outlawed in many respects. All right, and if that's not bad enough, the only ones who did really retain it would be like the Yakuza and these characters yeah. of ill repute, so it just went further down, right? I mean, one of the, mm-hmm. one of the greatest uh, figures in uh, Japanese history, uh, what many it's people... pronounced would... Yakuza. What okay. did I say? <laughs> Yakuza. Yakuza. Okay. Yeah. Yakuza. Yakuza. Yeah. Yakuza. It's because Japanese, the way they work, is the, um, what's it called? Vowels are never pronounced differently. Everything should be pronounced the same. So O's are always O. You know, yeah. A is always A. So right, it's right, Yakuza. Yeah. It's Yakuza. Okay, so That's Jonah is our martial arts grammar Nazi. I'm sorry, I know how to speak... Pro- I'm no, sorry, I know good. how the Japanese do their work Anyway, thing. It's why when good, I say good, but... Amaterasu, people hear, what the hell are you saying? I'm saying Amaterasu, not Amaterasu, Amaterasu. Did any of you Nagawaza. get that? 
Yeah. The Japanese anyway. goddess of the sun. Anyway, back to what I was saying. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Was, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? I'm having a senior citizen moment. Awesome. No, it, what, what they did, <laughs> what they did to, awesome. what, what they did about him because after after the war, was repressed. For, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they they practically neutered. they practically buried it. Like his his name was almost forgotten mm-hmm. in in the general public in Japan because of it. And it wasn't until, if I remember correctly, uh, some uh, Japanese anime, some guy decided to do an anime about uh, Musashi, and suddenly, boom. There, there he mm-hmm. was. Um, In the words of Naked Snake, the best heroes are the ones never made public. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, but it's true. You know, it, 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 there are certain people who've gone through history, and you know, they say, you know, it's the victor's name that uh, that people seem to remember. But you know, there's more than enough uh, important people that got. You know, not just martial arts, but people and human rights, and you know, all these important topics. Uh, help them move them forward, um, but you know most of the names we've forgotten, mm. yeah. right? Through, yep. Through history and whatnot. But no, it's good. You know, I I, I think that we've covered a lot of good stuff uh, through the course of events here because um, I was I myself was quite curious as to how the um, uh, MMA came to be. I mean, I've heard little tidbits of it, but I never really uh, knew the big story of it. So. Uh, so, we got to remember to do a plug for you again, uh, Pete. For your, uh, yeah, what's, for your the web, what's the website again, please? Oh, the oh, it's uh, MMAHQ.net. That's MMAHQ.net. Join us. <laughs> MMAHQ. With easy listening. <laughs> How's that for a plug? <laughs> Yeah, apparently with some easy we're, listening. We're we're we're, go- we're gonna have Hicks and Gracie fight Kenny G next week. <laughs> <laughs> if only we had. If only we oh, could. wouldn't that just be lovely? <laughs> anyway, uh, do we yeah. have any uh, geek? T- I think. Uh, um, do you have any geek talk back, Dave? I want to give you a chance to save your face for <laughs> the last two. Okay, Did I've got. I've, I do have one. Okay, uh, go ahead. A, a friend on Facebook who prefers to remain anonymous uh, mm-hmm. pointed out to me a, uh, a an article online uh, that proved my point that uh, a lot of these video games nowadays, and now here we're going to have Jonah and Pete both <laughs> jump on me. Uh, Yay! Uh, that they are being marketed specifically to kids. Mm-hmm. And Okay, uh, and who wrote the article? Uh well, therein lies the small problem because here's oh, where really? you're, here's here's where you're you're all going to just start laughing at me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on the cracked website. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, but the article is it, it's it's written by a guy that actually works in customer service on one of these mm-hmm. uh, for one of these gaming companies, okay. and he it, basically he does go on for a couple of pages about mm-hmm. how like it, th- these games are marketed to kids and kids are perfectly willing to rip off their parents, their grandparents, or anybody just so that they can keep playing these games and get, uh, or to get the pink armor, as Jonah would put it. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> oh, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I, uh... And, and mm-hmm. like I said, even during those episodes, that there are exceptions in some cases. No, uh, but this is actually a massive, to, massive industry and even specifically to your going own at comments, kids. Moses. That's that very odd. There are lots of parents that, that allow for that. So it's not about ripping them off. And that's that was very, one of your comments. That's very odd to me, though, because most of the games that I think of that have, you know, paid for content in them are aimed at older audiences like mm-hmm. Team Fortress 2, Dota, uh, yep. so many others, and uh, even Street Fighter, even console games like Street Fighter that have, you know, paid for content in the, are, you know, rated T, M, oh, so on and yeah. so forth. I don't 
under particularly understand just because that, just cause... because it's rated that doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's not being marketed to kids that young. I, I mean, know. Ju- just and I mean, the classic ju- going back and everybody makes going back <laughs> going back again to Pokemon. Deadpool. Going back to Deadpool. How many of the how how many people were complaining? They were told ahead of time the movie's rated R. Ryan Reynolds even don't made a point. Me. Ryan Reynolds even on went people. on Twitter s- telling people, "Don't take your kids to see this movie." And people were actually complaining. We're going online complaining. You know, I I took my kid to see this movie. (laughs) You have to take it to Geek Court. Geek Court. I don't. I don't even want to get on this subject. I it it disgusts me. I I chose the pure ignorance and yes, pure idiosity. Idiosity. I'm sorry. Idiosity. Idiosity. (laughs) Idiosity. (laughs) Whatever. I get it it from my buddy Ted. I want. Okay. One. So there. Okay, no, that's all good. Okay, so... Welcome welcome back to the circle. (laughs) Thank you very much, Jonah. (laughs) And thank you very much, uh, Pete. And And to those of you who are listening, terribly sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, You're going to notice a huge difference there, but hopefully that will be a thing of the past. (laughs) Yeah. And And, uh, just just as a reminder for for upcoming uh, episodes, we are still working towards the Geek Court uh, Moses is going to do a quick reminder of what that will consist of. But again, if you have any disagreements or arguments that you're having with boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, spouses, neighbors, whatever, about a certain geek talk topic. Yeah, we're stressing um, of a geek topic. I don't want yeah. to get people arguing about who should be doing the dishes. Or religion <laughs> or, you know, th- those things. You know, we want to talk about stuff that, you know, is this guy, is this better than the, this other? Is the original better <coughs> than the remakes? You know, this is the type of stuff that we want to, to, to focus on. We'll give each side an opportunity to talk and then we'll uh, we'll talk about that in the middle and we'll do these small recordings and piece them together later on. So that's Geek Court. Okay. So, that was another episode of Geek Talk MD. Pack up your thank lucky you dice. Thank you, everybody. Oh, you already said thank you. <laughs> yes. Did he say thank you? Oh, sorry. Thank okay. you, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. No, really no, no. You thank in. you, Mr. No, Avogadro. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, thank, thank you. you. No. You're not my pal, friend. Domo arigato gozaimashita. You're not my friend, guy. <laughs> You're not my guy, buddy. You're Don't not call my me buddy, buddy. buddy. <laughs> so, pack up your lucky dice, put away the Chinese food menus, and we'll see you next time on another episode of Geek Talk MD. Good night. Good night, everybody. Nighty. Good night. <laughs>